Now I'd like to introduce to you Byron Holland. Byron Holland will provide more detail today as to why we are here and what we hope to accomplish. Byron Holland is the president, and you heard from him just a moment ago, the president and chief executive officer of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority, CIRA. It's a position that he has held since January 2008. His focus is on security, stability, and resiliency of the .ca domain name system, and sound operation and policy development that supports the .ca registry. In striving for operational excellence, Holland provides sound financial management, ensures exceptional customer service, and observes and implements globally recognized best practices at CIRA. He also represents Canadian interests in numerous international fora, including the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, the ICANN, and the Internet Governance Forum. Excuse me. I also wanted to tell you that he's the vice chair of the Country Code Operators Group, the global organization for all CC operators. Prior to being at ICANN, Holland was a founding member and the chief operating officer of Futura Rewards, the third largest coalition loyalty program in Canada. At Futura, Holland oversaw the development and growth of the company from a small upstart to a publicly traded company with more than 100 brand partners and 400,000 members. Holland holds a Bachelor's of Arts with honors from the University of Western Ontario and a Master of Business Administration from Queen's University. He also holds his, ICC, his ICD.D designation from the Institute of Corporate Directors. Holland maintains a blog called Public Domain in which he discusses issues of interest to the Canadian internet community, including internet governance and technology, and he also can be found on Twitter at CIRA001. Good to have you with us today, Byron. All right, well, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, we certainly appreciate it, and we're really excited to see such a great turnout. You can all call me Byron, though, instead of uh, Holland. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even you, Chris. Um, Again, thanks everybody. Uh, we're really excited to have this kind of a turnout for a discussion on essentially the important issues of the internet and internet governance and how we, and I honestly say that as we, everybody here in the room, not just we as CIRA, operate this thing uh, called the internet. And I, I, just before I get started, I wanted to mention one thing or pick up on something that Jacob said that I think is really important. And uh, I have no financial interest in this, I assure you. But a book he referred to by Jonathan Zetrain called uh, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. For anybody who is really concerned about the internet and the future of the internet and what needs to be done and what should be avoided, I think it is the most important book we can all read for those of us who are concerned about the future of the internet. Uh, it's called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. Anyway, again, thanks for being here. Uh, what I'd like to do today is just give you a little bit of an overview of what CIRA, my organization, and our partners, ISD and MNET, have been up to in getting to this day. And give you a little bit of background on that and talk about internet governance, the actual internet governance piece of, of uh, today, and a little bit about the future of it and some of the issues that are going on. You know, some people think that you know, internet governance, hmm, that's, a, that's a little dry. But uh, honestly, I'm unbelievably passionate about it. It is one of the most interesting, dynamic, all-pervasive fields that I think that anybody could be involved in. There is so much happening at so many levels. It's so multifaceted. It touches every element of our lives. And really, it truly does, particularly in a modern economy. And it's probably also one of the most important things we can engage in. So I say no, it's not dry at all. It's fascinating. The whole industry, the whole ecosystem. But here's my standard cocktail conversation, and I've had enough of them to see a pattern. Not, not that I go to too many cocktail parties, but 
<laughs> I've gone to enough that it's not a data point of one, so I see a trend. Um, you know, hi Byron, what do you do? Well, I do this thing at Sierra.ca, et cetera. And that's when the blank stare sets in. And the inevitable question, and I swear to you, it's nine out of 10 times. Somebody runs the internet? <laughs> and literally, I, you know, it seems a bit of a joke, but that is the constant refrain. Because people just don't understand. How does this thing actually happen and, and operate? And yet, unlike almost anything else, we all use it. There are a few industries or issues that you can talk about that literally affect every single Canadian. Every single Canadian, almost on a daily basis. And yet it just works. It's just all pervasive. It just works. You know, the fact is, as much as I hate to admit it, most people in Canada have not even heard of CIRA. Now, it's getting better, of course, uh, particularly since 2008. But um, the fact is, most people have not heard of, of CIRA. And yet, and I think I can honestly make this claim, every single Canadian is my customer, is CIRA's customer. Every single Canadian. Anytime a .ca is used, anytime a .ca is registered, at the end of the day, it's trickling up to us. And yet, most Canadians don't know who we are, in part because it just works. And in large part, because of the governance model behind the internet. So how do we get here? You know, the question often is, who runs the internet? And of course, the answer is, we all do. Some more than others, but we all do, and we all have a really profound stake in it. So let me, let me begin by the really short history of the internet, and I promise, because most people know the basic details, it's a short history of the internet. We know the facts. 60s and 70s, researchers, academics, the military basically created the technology behind it. Uh, in the mid-90s, depending how you want to actually uh, market, mid-90s, we started to see the commercialization, different applications happening. 10 years ago, there's 100 million people on the internet. Fast forward to today, two billion people on the internet. That's an absolutely amazing fact. And we toss it out, we say it, but when you stop to think about it, it's absolutely incredible. And it continues to grow at a, at a profound rate. Um, if you think about the protocols, the rules, the policies, the standards, um, the law, legal infrastructure behind it, the architecture itself, we heard about IPv4, IPv6, but all the technology that underpins it. All of those things started to occur as the internet was, was forming. And the key thing here is it was made possible by a really a bottom-up consensus-based uh, decision-making structure. It was fairly organic, right? I mean, we, we heard about researchers and how they act and come together. I mean, essentially, in the engineering world in particular, that's how the internet got created, certainly at the protocol and technology level. And that's what informed the governance model. So out of that, you know, it, it became a technology and then we started to commercialize it, but it already had some history and it was already running and already had people involved with long histories in it. And that's how the governance model really came about. It became, and these are really key words, and again, they get said and they're just, you know, half a dozen words strung together, but they're profoundly important in terms of how we operate the internet. And that it is a bottom-up, consensus-driven, multi-stakeholder environment. And that is a truly unique governance model in any kind of a global entity, global ecosystem. So it's bottom-up, this is it. Right? We all here in this room have a stake in operating the internet. That's bottom up. We heard the question earlier, right? Where do we go to speak about my issue on the internet? Well, this is it. It's bottom up. It's consensus driven in that there are many different voices, many different competing interests, many different issues, many different points of view on how do you do security? How fast should we go to IPv6? Should we add DNSSEC in yesterday, today, tomorrow? 
you have to come to some consensus to make this global ecosystem operate together. And that's the key part. Therefore, it's multi-stakeholder. We all get to have a say. Government, for sure. Business, the industry, the various elements of the industry. Uh, other NGOs. Civil society has a huge role to play here. It's truly a multi-stakeholder environment. And that, to me, apart from all the cool technologies and all of the stuff that makes it work, that, to me, is the key driving force that really allows it to have done what it's done in the past 10 years. And believe it or not, I think to a great degree it is the governance model that's enabled it. It's that, it's that structure. You think about the internet. We heard some today, right? The innovation it's unleashed. The wealth creation it's unleashed. You know, ironic, you know, here on March Road, right next to Newbridge, um, think about what the internet enabled on this street in particular, just in this town. And it's done that all around the world. Wealth creation, job creation, innovation, entire new industries that didn't exist a year, two years, five years ago. And what are we all watching? What are we all transfixed with this week and in the past few weeks? Right? Tunisia, Egypt, uh, um, Libya right now. The whole Middle East on fire. Now, obviously, that was pent up issues. But the internet and technology has enabled this thing to happen that could have likely never happened before. So it's democracy, interaction, communication, all of those things, I believe, have really been enabled by the internet and the structure, the governance structure of the internet. And the reason I want to talk about the governance structure in particular, because obviously we have something to do with that at CIRA, but it's a choice, right? We live with that today, and many people assume well, that's just the way it is. But it's not just the way it is, right? There is a choice. There are alternate models as to how we would govern the internet. Uh, and primarily, the other one is what we call a multilateral treaty-based model. And if you think of how the telcos are organized globally, they, they, uh, the internet is operated, or sorry, the telco environment is really operated by the IT, the International Telecommunications Union. It's run out of the UN. It's a state-to-state, treaty-based, UN-based environment. So if you pick two, you know, potentially similar or sister industries, that's the other model. Now, think about that. Would we, would we as internet citizens want the UN in a multilateral, treaty-based environment to be operating the internet. Well, I would posit to you that I don't think that that would necessarily be helpful in wealth creation, job creation, innovation, all of the things I just listed, because the, internet, uh, the UN does many things well, but speed is probably not one of them, and innovation likely not either. And part of it is just structural. The institutional burden, burdens, the process, the procedure that you have to go uh, through in an environment like that. Also, I mean, let's, let's call a spade a spade. There are many countries who don't necessarily share our views on freedom of expression, privacy, democracy, open communication, liberal economies, uh, all of those issues, and yet when you go to a multilateral environment like that, you will now be subject to one country, one vote. And that starts to change the dynamic of doing what's best for the internet. And in the multi-stakeholder model, it really is all about, while we may disagree on the details, what is best for the internet. So it is a choice. And um, you know, I really want to emphasize that strongly. It's a choice, and it's a dialogue and a debate. And you know, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but in a sense, it's a battle that's happening right now. Which should it be? Particularly as more and more countries who haven't traditionally been online come online and have valid concerns, right? Have valid opinions. So how do we balance those? But I would just say, I would, I would posit again that the multi-stakeholder governance model just works. It has its flaws, it has its bad days, but it works. And the testament there is in what it has produced in 10 years. Why does it do that? Well, for one thing, you have many people. You have the best and the brightest from all over the world working on this issue, working in this ecosystem. 
responsible for all the different parts. You have many organizations playing crucial roles. You know, CIRA operates its little piece of the internet, but we do it pretty well. And there's many others who do, uh, do the same thing to ensure that critical functionality. A wide variety of interests are represented. So we heard the question earlier, you know, how do I get my interest expressed or how do I express my interest here? Which in the uh, treaty-based model, that would be you know, the question earlier that I responded to. That would be a tough interest to get expressed at the UN. It also works because no one region controls it. So you're always generally assured that the best solution is going to bubble to the top, at least eventually. And this governance model inherently, because it's multi-stakeholder, creates significant redundancy. And those of us operating the internet, you know, redundancy is, of course, one of the key features that we, uh, we need to concern ourselves with. I'll just make a plug for Sierra. On October 13th, anybody notice the internet go off in Canada? No, good. We did the biggest project ever, which was we replaced the entire registry itself for .ca. So that's kind of the equivalent of, yet yeah, we pulled out the engine and put a new one in the moving car, and nobody noticed. So um, you know, when you, it takes a pretty significant level of redundancy to get something like that done. And organizations like ours all around the world are doing exactly that. So what's, what's Sierra's role in, in governance? I mean, clearly we operate a bunch of the plumbing, the registry itself, the DNS, security. But we also operate in the governance space very, very actively. In fact, I would say um, Canada in general fights well above its weight in the international gover uh, internet governance world, the global internet governance world. In fact, one of uh, the Industry Canada folks is the chair of the government body within ICANN, ICANN being the global coordinator of the internet. So one of our citizens, one of our Industry Canada folks, is the chair of the entire government stakeholder body within this multi-stakeholder model, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty uh, significant comment on Canada's contribution to it. And of course, you heard I participate pretty actively too. And there's folks all over who are Canadian involved in this. So CIRA, we represent uh, .ca's interests very vocally um, and consistently in the global internet governance landscape. And one of our key objectives, one of CIRA's key objectives is to, and, and I quote this because it's part of our, our corporate uh, objectives, is to develop, carry out, and or support any other internet-related activities in Canada above and beyond running the registry uh, itself. As part of CIRA's stewardship of the dot, uh, CA domain space, we developed a community investment program, and it, it's there to really help foster that notion of, of basically doing other good stuff for the internet in Canada. And that, in a sense, is how we get here today. It's our fundamental belief, and, and mine, I participate very actively in this space, it is our profound belief that the multi-stakeholder model is the right model and that we need to uh, promote it and we certainly, from time to time, we need to defend it, too. We, you know, we, and I use that as a collective we, everybody in this room and the people that we engage with, we all need to understand that, that we play a role in that, in that ecosystem. And as Canadian internet citizens, um, it's, it behooves us to know how this thing operates and to participate in it, uh, which, of course, includes the, the CIF today. So I'm very happy that we've had such a great turnout because to us, it just shows us the level of interest and in expression or of interest in internet governance. So a little bit of the background here today. Um, you know, the multi-stakeholder model has basically influenced everything we've done. To get to this moment today, it's really informed us um, on pretty much everything we've done. So we talked a little bit about doing the research in 09 that allowed us to get here. Um, we've, you know, we really took the pulse and got a sense of what the hot issues were. Our, our friends at Industry Canada were very encouraging to go forward with this. And we were certainly inspired by the global uh, IGF. So every year since 06, there's been a global IGF where every country, multi-stakeholder, industry, ISPs, civil society groups, everybody comes together to, to discuss the key issues. Uh, we've also seen regional ones. So, UK and Europe have been very active. Actually, Russia's done their own. 
Western and Eastern Africa have essentially IGFs of their own. All of those feed up into the global ones. So it's taking all of the insights and feedback and you know, hopes, desires, everything that those internet communities agree upon and bring them forward to the global IGF where it's discussed in a multi-stakeholder model within a UN environment. It's an interesting hybrid. But back to this, uh, to this event, the research started in 2009. Uh, there's a few phases to it. So the consultation, we followed up the research with some consultations across the country. It was mostly with invited parties because we wanted to ensure that we got a broad cross-section of stakeholders. Uh, th there's the national meeting today, of course, where mostly we're hoping not just to have folks listen to what people on stage are saying, but of course, for you to ask questions, for you to engage, to, for you to express opinions. From that, a white paper is going to be written, uh, which we'll make publicly available so everybody can see what our take on, on this is or what we've seen and heard. And then, of course, it'll be presented in September uh, in Kenya to uh, the global IGF. So in a sense, it'll be, this is what we've heard from the Canadian internet landscape. So in terms of phase one, we, we, you know, we did the classic Canadian. We went east, we went west, we went north. We hit uh, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Aqualua, Toronto, um, Halifax, and Vancouver. Well, I guess that's not really east to west, but we, we did go to all those cities. And we partnered with ISD and MNET to help us out on, uh, on those. Participation was by invitation, like I said earlier. It's really to ensure we got a, a wide, wide cross-section of, um, of participants. And what, ended, what we ended up seeing is there started to be a pretty consistent couple of themes that showed up, and they were really what we would broadly categorize as um, economic development and digital literacy. Now, of course, broadly defined, but they would seem to fit in either of those two buckets for the most part. And, you know, so why did we pick those elements? Well, fundamentally, that's what we heard. We were listening. That's what we heard. That's what's important to Canadians, be it cybercrime or privacy or IPv6 on the economic front or, you know, social cohesion, pure digital literacy issues, and I think Jerry's probably doing a better job than I of describing it, but that's what we heard. So I think there's a couple slides here that we'll just move through because I want to really get to the discussion, but we talked to private sector, NGOs, government, academics, educators, youth groups, unions, I mean, very broad and fulsome uh, across the country. When we drilled down on inside those two primary categories, what did we see? Well, <laughs> you know, and I think we, we've already heard it today, right? We heard loud and clear, broadband access and speed. You know, price and speed is really what it came down to. Because as Marta said, we actually have good uh, access. It's the other issues that prevent people from actually getting online or accessing the internet. So broadband at speed and cost, uh, IPv6, a clear issue. Um, on the digital literacy side, it was really, really around online safety, privacy issues, security issues, those types of things. And of course, education, education, education. How can we utilize this great thing, the internet, to really help and foster that? Be it pure education or research, like we heard about from Jim. And then the other thing that we heard loud and clear cross-cutting was that, uh, disappointment in Canada's digital ranking, right? So we heard Jim earlier today talk about some of the facts and figures around Canada and the fact that when, no matter which one you pick, we seem to be fluttering down the list, which we don't want to be. We have a history of being at the top of the list. We should be there. And that came across loud and clear. Uh, policy discussion and open dialogue, we heard that loud and clear, which is one of the reasons that we have this event. Um, open government and Innovation, innovation, innovation. How do we foster? How do we get it going? How do we ensure that it happens? So what have we heard so far? Well, basically, Canadians are engaged. And look at this room. Look around you. I mean, I think this is a testament to it. Consistent feedback that we need to have the discussion. And I, I hate to keep going back to the question right before the break, but, you know, where do we have this conversation? How do I get my opinion at? Well, you know, this is it. That's what we're trying to do right here. As one of the outlets in a multi-stakeholder model. And we also heard from people, you know, we also did ask, him, is this Sierra's role? Should Sierra be doing this? Should somebody else be doing it? And we had pretty consistent feedback that no, Sierra as a not-for-profit entity operating uh, on behalf of all Canadians in a stewardship role, you know, this is a reasonable place 
to have this discussion. And we also found that there's a lot of communities who are really concerned, well, great, you're going out and doing this, but what about keeping doing it? You know, I don't wanna, we don't have a point in time discussion, we, have an on, we wanna have an ongoing dialogue. So those are some of the messages that we heard and that we wanted to talk about today. And that's what we're gonna do for, for the rest of the afternoon is present some of the findings in more detail and I've certainly elaborated on, and then have that dialogue, have that discussion. So what we really wanna get is your opinion, your comments, thoughts, questions, and we heard some really good ones before the break to start with, so I hope we get a bunch more of that. I know we have a big queue from the online world um, who didn't get to ask their questions, so maybe we'll start with some of those. And of course, the Twitter feed actually has been uh, very, very active for those of you who've been checking that out. And there's nothing like when you're trying to actually <laughs> give a speak to see the real-time feedback, like, uh, you know, you blew your words, you stumbled, uh, <laughs> you know. It's pretty, pretty quick feedback, um, for better or for worse. Anyway, it, it's certainly going, uh, going fast. So, you know, the real goal today is to solicit your feedback, collect further input, and all of this will get distilled into the white paper that we make available to everybody, as well as present to the rest of the world in September. So thanks very much for participating, and um, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris, but I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Vous invite encore, ouais. there we go. Vous invite encore à parler, donner vos questions en français parce qu'on a des écouteurs pour Byron aussi, il peut, il peut avoir la traduction. So questions, there's one hand popped up right there. We have time for about three, four questions, and then we'll take a break and uh, feed you. Hello, I'm Jocelyn Edouard. Uh, has the electronic has been developing more or less at the exponential rate, the uh, connections, uh, the networking, the storage space, and everything. And the price has been going down quite a lot. But the internet, my speed connections basically, has been the same for many years. The price is not going down. Uh, ISP has been blocking many uh, ports, uh, different throttling down on the, depending on the type of communication. Is Syrah has any power? to um, improve on that, and who has? <laughs> well, good we started with an easy one. <laughs> do we have any power to do anything about it? No, not in the uh, way that one might interpret that question is can we push a button and make something happen or make a law and make something happen. That's not what we do. I mean, we operate the registry, we operate the DNS, we participate in governance loudly and strongly and frequently. And given the position that we occupy, we have a fairly respected voice and opinion because I have the benefit of running a shop full of experts who are deeply committed to the internet. Uh, we're not for profit. Our only interest really is the effective functioning of the internet. So we certainly raise those issues. We bring those to the forums. I mean, you know, loosely defined, you talked about net neutrality and speed and price. We certainly bring those to the fore. We contributed to the Industry Canada uh, consultation and we raised some of those issues, speed and price issues. Um, so we participate vigorously. We make our voice heard and because of who we are, to a great degree, we get listened to but we don't control those issues. Here. Je m'appelle Abdul Khan, je suis uh, concepteur de site web. Vous me donnez un second? You might need the headphones. They're right yeah, beside you. They're gone. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get another set of headphones, please? Just un moment, s'il vous plaît. Oui, donc je disais que je m'appelle Abdul Khan et je conçois des sites web. Alors, euh, um, Apple, Sun, Google, Bing, Bing, Android, iOS, toutes ces euh, compagnies qui tournent autour de l'Internet sont américains. Alors, euh, moi, j'aimerais savoir euh, quel, quel est le futur d'Internet, quelle est la place du Canada dans ce futur-là. Est-ce que le Canada va prendre une place plus prépondérante et qu'est-ce que le CIRA pourra faire pour... Euh, offrir uh, une, place, uh, une meilleure place uh, pour le Canada dans le futur d'Internet. So 
so fundamentally, the question um, is really around Canada's place in terms of innovation and position and technology globally. And that, you know, we talked to, you know, we listened to Google, we talked, to, we talked about Facebook and many of the other internet company names that everybody would know, and of course, not many of them are Canadian. And where does that leave us and what, what's our future for that? Uh, we have an incredible amount of highly talented people here. When I go out into the internet governance world, it's peppered with Canadians. I mean, we do have good firms, um, be they, you know, RIM, of course, is top of mind, a top global firm, but there are certainly many others. You know, one of the big challenges, and I come from the private sector previously and uh, raised in a previous life, you know, raised a lot of money for new venture companies. And that's one of the biggest challenges is getting, is getting those seed companies funded. There's great ideas, great engineers, great business people, great thinkers right here in this town. This street has produced a ton of them. Jim being one of them, you know. You think about the innovation, job creation, wealth creation, new ideas that Jim has been the CEO of companies of. We have it here. We're not necessarily enabling it. And I would say it starts at that base level where we're not as supportive of the VC industry as we need to be. And we heard the stats there. And if there's one thing I'm really worried about, it's not the talent. It's the how do we enable the talent. And it, in, in terms of commercializing new ventures, it starts right there. And if they can't get the money, well, that, that basically prevents that seed from germinating. Or, you know, to beat the metaphors, right? I mean, the cash is the fuel. And if you starve the engine for fuel, well, you know, it's not going to run well. And we have a bit of that right now. And, and what happens? All our great Canadians and all their great Canadian ideas, they go where they can get cash. And this street, you know, ironically, I didn't think I'd be talking about VC, but I've spent a fair amount of time in that space. Ironically, this street is the metaphor for anybody who's lived in Ottawa through the, you know, through the glory days and then sees what's happened here over the ensuing decade. A big piece of it is the money's dried up and the engineers and the ideas, and there's lots of good ones, and that's what I want to stress. There's lots of great Canadian ideas. They have to go where they can get funded, and I think that's one of the biggest linchpins that we need to solve on the innovation front in Canada. Thank you. We'll take an online question. Online we question? Have a, yes, we have a question from the, uh, the online chat room from Garth Graham. How can we move the discussion beyond opinion leaders? That's a great question, and I really wish more people would ask that, actually, because that's what's happening in this room, right? I mean, the, you've listened to some great opinion, you know, I guess people who would be called opinion leaders, right? Deep experts in their field who have strong and valid opinions, and they bring them to bear regularly, and, and uh, I guess I'd have to include myself in that as an evangelist for the multi-stakeholder model. These events are where everybody's ideas and issues get brought to the fore, to get surfaced. So I think we have a real opportunity to do exactly that here, and that's one of the powers of the multi-stakeholder model. And it's not just here today on the floor, it's on the online environment that we'll be providing ongoing. Um, anybody can participate in the global IGF. You, you do have to get yourself there, but everybody's welcome, and you can participate for free, or at least the cost, whatever your ISP charges you, online. So you can continue to participate and get your questions answered at the global level and continue to participate with us online uh, at the more local or national level. More questions from the floor? Back from the right. Hi, my name is Karen McCrimmon. I'm the federal liberal candidate for this riding. I'd like to go back to your comment about venture capital and what give us an idea of a couple of recommendations for changing the way venture capital is managed here in this country? What would you do? <laughs> that was my last career, right? Um, <laughs> now I'm worried about multi-stakeholderism. I mean, part of it is cultural. Canadians have to be willing to take risks. So that's kind of a broad statement. But I mean, we got lots of great ideas. We shouldn't be afraid to step out there and take the risk and roll the dice. So that's a cultural element that we should foster and enable. And you know what? In order to hit a good idea, a few bad ones are going to happen. Let's just get over it. And let's, let's create a tax environment 
that fosters the willingness and the appetite to take risk. Let's also create that kind of structural environment um, that enables it. So we need to have tax policy around uh, capital gains and stock and options and stuff that makes sense to help enable that environment, that fundamentally enables people to take risk in a reasonable way. And I think we need to do a little bit more of that. But that, I'd be happy to talk offline about that. Um, it, it probably doesn't fall necessarily right into the multi-stakeholder model, even though I mentioned it to begin with. But that's where it starts with innovation. And the fuel for innovation often is the money. Go test you. Right here. You'll just, microphone's coming, sir. Thanks. My name is Dan Brazo. I'm CEO and president of Croc Local. Uh, my question is, a little bit like the gentleman asked, I mean, it's okay to say uh, it's a money issue, but then again, uh, sometimes we get the sense that if you're not part of the exclusive or limited club of the internet, it's kind of hard to get into it, besides the money issue. I mean, it's, you get the sense that if the idea was to be brought up by someone else, it'd be a go. Uh, and, you know, what's your, how can you compete with that? I mean, it's... I think there's an awful, I mean, I do think there's a lot of opportunity for Canadians to participate in the internet, be it in the governance world where, you know, my main beat is these days, um, or the operating of it. You know, Facebook came out of a dorm room at a university in the U.S., but there's no reason that it couldn't have come out of a dorm room at Ottawa U or Queens or, or wherever here. I mean, there's nothing preventing us from doing that. Yeah, accessing cash if you're a new venture in Ottawa is a, is a tough grind, but the ideas can certainly be enabled, and that's one of the, uh, I think, amazing powers of, of the internet. Like, look at the apps being developed for iPhone. They're being developed from all over the world. There's nothing stopping you or a kid in a university dorm here from creating apps. That, that, and that's just one little example. I mean, it's up to us to put that business model forward. And if it has success, the great thing about the internet is it is a networked opportunity. There's a profound opportunity to have that success. I mean, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think we do have a great opportunity as Canadians because we're also well regarded, even in, VC, in US VC environments. So I think the opportunity is there. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have native structures here that are really helping foster that appetite or that ability to take risk as well as we could, as well as we could. Well, and, and you guys can really change that, frankly. I mean, we can complain all, we want, all day long that we're, you know, we used to be on top and we're going backwards. And I mean, I think we're not getting in there for quite a bit of time. And we realize we've got great ideas, but if they go to different news bodies, you know, it's like going to the ball with the wrong person. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Um, <laughs> sure, it's true. Um, what do we do as CIRA? You know, I, the, one of the benefits that we have is I have a bully pulpit to some degree. And part of what we do is educate and inform and incite opinions. And we can do what we can do. And, and to a great degree, this is what we do. We've been able to convene you know, 400 people to come and talk about the internet issues plus the people online, right? Our hope, my hope is that now you're all our ambassadors and you're gonna go out there and convene your own audiences and start to talk about some of these issues. So what can CIRA do? It's to engage, to inform, to educate, to entertain hopefully to some degree and to get people thinking about these issues, to get people, you know, metaphorically reading that book so that can help them think about, wow, there's all kinds of opportunity and there's risk and we need to address them both. So that's what CIRA's engaged in, engaging the community and getting the message out and that is what we're doing. We'll take an online question. Thank you, I have an online question uh, from Darlene Thompson. Um, why weren't the consultations uh, better advertised? They seemed um, to be closed to those of us who would have liked to participate. It's a delicate balance. You know, it's a first event. Um, are there things we could have done differently, better, worse? Uh, yes. Would we have liked to involve more? Would we have liked to involve more people? Absolutely. The fact is, you know, we are funding a first event and we had to start somewhere. And 
the small consultations that we organized, albeit they were, as, as I said, by invitation, but what we tried to do is make sure we had good representation from a wide, wide range of stakeholders. So did we nail it perfectly? Maybe not, but I think, I think we did a pretty good job and we got some really, really high quality feedback. And all it is is a jumping off point. Um, now, you know, you have the opportunity right now to ask the question and continue to ask those questions in an online world. So hopefully next year will be bigger and better. My name is Nikolai Bilanyuk. I'm the CEO of a uh, green tech startup, but I'm not going to talk about VC, okay? <laughs> um, in fact, I'm more interested in the, uh, uh, the governance models, the um, multilateral treaty versus um, the multi-stakeholder. Uh, I've been involved in some standards bodies, and in particular, I've seen some disasters related to this issue at the ISO IEC. And what happens is, is that um, even though you have nominally delegations representing countries, in fact, they often end up representing particular corporate interests. And um, what some uh, companies end up doing is overtly pushing their agenda, but sometimes they also use submarine uh, IP, and um, that can make it very difficult, especially for people in the open source community to produce products because they cannot pay the uh, royalties. So I just wanted you to, um, uh, well, yellow card this, as it were, to use some soccer terminology, that. Um, the, uh, there's a problem there. I hope the I, uh, ETF doesn't get caught up in this, and I hope that CIRA can play a role in uh, ensuring that whatever standards are adopted are, in fact, free from uh, submarine intellectual property. Thank you for that comment. And there's a question right behind you. Yeah. And just to, we do participate actively in the technical elements of the Internet, not just the governance space where I tend to spend my time. Um, my name is Xander Miller. I had the experience of uh, living a number of years in Japan. And uh, I was wondering like, when, when we're looking at um, these issues of how can we prevent ourselves from falling behind, um, why do we tend to compare ourselves to the United States, uh, who is also having a lot of those issues? Why do we not instead look to the countries like uh, South Korea and Japan who have succeeded in a huge way. They're offering access speeds um, that are six to ten times on average greater to the general public than we have in Canada. Why are we not looking at what they're doing and how they're governing things and how they're achieving success and model our systems after, after their success instead of just focusing on other countries that are failing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> I think it's safe to say I probably speak for most people when I say we shouldn't model ourselves after failing uh, experiments. The, uh, I mean, the U.S. is doing stuff that has value too. So, I mean, I think you're asking a great social question. Why do Canadians always look south before they look anywhere else? Um, I mean, I have an opinion, but it's, uh, you know, that and 25 cents will get you coffee or four bucks at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> when I speak, <laughs> I speak a reasonable amount in internet spaces. I personally, this wasn't really the kind of environment to talk specifically about those things, at least not from my point of view. I generally reference South Korea, uh, Japan, some of the European countries which are very progressive when you talk about speed when you talk about speed per dollar, bandwidth, access, penetration rates, all of those metrics that Jim was talking about in a sense, I, there's a whole raft of them. And in other discussions, I speak to those very frequently. And the interesting thing too is in about a 10 year time frame, South Korea, which was not on that list that, uh, that Jim referred to, right? The OECD list, 23 is the bottom. South Korea, what well, didn't make it on the list? And in 10 years, they've gone from not on the list to basically one, two, or three in every metric. Penetration rate, speed, price, internet usage, bandwidth, you know, pick your metric. 
10 years ago, we were 1, 2, 3 in all of them, and now we're 12, 13, 14, 15, depending which one you pick. There's a whole bunch of reasons. There's no silver bullet. You also got to remember somewhere like South Korea uh, has a different kind of democracy than we do. So, I mean, you have more of a state-driven group of companies that provide those things. So, I mean, there are differences that you have to recognize. You can't just say, geez, they have, you know, 60 megabit per second to the home for a few dollars. Well, yeah, but there are structural issues that enable that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look at them. You know, uh, South Korea, I think, just released, they're putting 100 megabit to the home, 100 megabit per second to the home. 100 megabit per second to the home. I, you know, a funny story, I was, um, uh, and I'll keep it short, I promise. I, I was uh, at a dinner with friends who live in the civic hospital area. Yeah, this is not exactly remote. It's a nice, it's a nice neighborhood. You know, it's done that whole gentrification thing. And he's just, my friend is just completely renovated, has this incredible house. We're there for dinner. It's really nice. And we start talking about Netflix and getting Netflix. And he's like, oh, yeah, I have it. But it gets all pixelated because I can only get one and a half to two meg to this house. That's in the civic hospital area. And he's, you know, he's done his thing to try to get it. They advertise six, pay for six, get two. But structurally, that's what he can get in that neighborhood. Um, and yet South Korea is putting 100 meg to the home. You know, I, I take your point, and I, now I'm, I guess I'm rambling a little bit. We should look at those because they're benchmarks, but you do have to look at the fact that they have political and structural differences, let alone geographic. I mean, been to South Korea, right? It's, it's a lot of people in a small amount of space, so it's a different kind of problem, too. But we should hold ourselves up to those ones. And uh, Northern European ones as well are probably more relevant in terms of tough geography, sparse geography, uh, uh, cultural political similarities. So though, and they're still way ahead of us. So I might look first to what's Sweden and Norway? How do they look? And they look better than we do. We have one more question before lunch. All right, so My 140 years ago, we built. The microphone's coming. Right, so 140 years ago, we built a railway. Could you let us know who you are, sir? Oh, sorry, Blake Cram, um, InfoWeb Media. Um, and then we built arguably one of the best telecommunication systems in our telephone system. In both cases, it took, you know, huge national initiative. It took the government to be completely behind it. Can't we build this network? Can't we take Canary and build, you know, this? a similar network as South Korea and some of the other countries that you've mentioned? Um, and how do we put all of the stakeholders that you talk about, the multi-governance kind of thing, and bring everybody together to build that kind of a network? So there's a, um, there's a number of questions in there. Uh, and certain, I think, you know, using the metaphor of the railroad or the, or the telco, initial telco investments, is a reasonable one. Um, particularly in a landscape that's very, very broad and sparsely populated. Uh, that, that said, I mean, there has been significant investment in the infrastructure from the private sector. I think, um, you know, Industry Canada in particular is trying to sort out what are some of the best competitive models. One of the really interesting issues, it's access versus availability, right? And Jerry touched on it, and it's something not to be missed. And it's, it's the fact that 95-plus percent of Canadians have broadband availability. A bunch of them, for a number of reasons, choose not to access it. But the point is they have broadband availability near them. Now, after I've just told you about my friend with 2 meg service, I, I, I'll talk to out of my left and then out of my right side. But... Um, you know, we do, that still, believe it or not, qualifies as broadband these days. Uh, um, so the issue to me isn't as much do people have it, it's why are they not tapping into what they have? And I think those are a different set of issues that start to become more policy and competition based. But I, that's an area that I generally don't tread, to be perfectly honest, because that's not our bailiwick. Our bailiwick is to get people here to talk about some of those issues, and there's lots of government folks in the room who are listening to your question and who are going to go back to their shops and start talking about that. 
So, I mean, I think that's what we as CIRA can do to start trying to address some of those issues.